Ye, ye, 
solvebant munia lauris, nos tibi regnanti, angimus et semelus. Gloria laus et honor tibi si, Rex Christe Redemptor, coi puerile decus, prompsito sana pium. I placuere tibi, Se a te vocio nostra, rex monere esclemens, cui bona conta placent. Gloria laus et honor divisit, rex Christe. Gloria laus et honor 
Ex Christe Redemptor, coi puerile de cus, prompsito sana pium, i placuere Gloria a Dios, se 
Okay, finally. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome back. And um, I think I was pretty clear in the show description underneath if you um, if you read it. Of course, uh, I started the show. I'll leave the poll up for a while um, about whether, you know, the majority would prefer the prison cell Divine Mercy Chaplet or the you know, from from the studio, so to speak, Divine Mercy Chaplet. And after the Divine Mercy Chaplet, I'm going to talk a little bit about today's uh, Mass readings from the Latin Mass. Just a little bit, just, I doubt it'll be more than five minutes, and maybe ten minutes at the most. And then I'm going to play again the show from three years ago that I played yesterday that goes through what Jesus did and his teaching. Uh, every He went to the temple every day during Holy Week. Um, and he, you know, preached and taught in the, uh, I forget, the porch, the porch of the temple. And I talked about that uh I talked about those two days, Monday and Tuesday, on a show three years ago, and I played it yesterday, and I'm going to play the exact same show today. So if you saw it yesterday, you probably have better things to do. But I don't know how many people saw it yesterday. I don't know how many people are here today that weren't here yesterday. And I did go through both days, and um, so it's, you know, maybe worthwhile for those of you who didn't catch it yesterday. Uh, 
so anyway, that's that. And some people may want to see it a second time, but I don't want to. Um, I don't want to encourage anybody to, uh, if they're not already inclined to, because um, it's a long, you know, it's a long talk. It's about eighty minutes, I think. Okay. So let me, let me begin. Without further ado, with the Saint Michael. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him. We humbly pray and do thou, o Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin and destruction of souls. Amen. Saint Joan of Arc, patroness of France and patroness of our prayer group, we ask you now to fight this battle with us by prayer, just as you led your troops to victory in battle. You who are filled with the Holy Spirit and chosen by God, help us this day with the favor that we ask of you, that we all receive the graces which will result in us getting into heaven with all our loved ones, and that you intercede to defeat the current attempt to enslave humanity under the one world antichrist government. Grant us by your divine and powerful intercession the courage and strength we need to endure this constant fight and to emerge victorious, St. Joan, pious daughter of the Church. Pray for us. Amen. And the prayer for the conversion of the Jews. I will go back to the Radisbone prayer since we're in Holy Week here. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, have pity on the children of Israel. Jesus of Nazareth, divine Messiah, expected by the Jews, have pity on the children of Israel. Jesus of Nazareth, of the tribe of Judah, have pity on the children of Israel. Jesus of Nazareth, who healed the deaf, the dumb, and the blind, have pity on the children of Israel. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Amen. And so on to the Divine Mercy Chaplet. And the gap has closed a little bit, but it's still more than two to one for the prison cell. Looks like it is 69% to 31%. So, um, so that's five, 11 to 5, I think. So I will go to the prison cell. So let me go to the prison cell now. First, I'll bring myself up in the meantime before I disappear into the prison cell. Um, I say this each time, but this Divine Mercy Chaplet was um, recorded on my cell phone when I was alone in the prison cell that Jesus spent the night before Good Friday in. It is a underground cell, a hole in the ground, essentially, under Caiaphas's palace on Mount Zion. Um, and he was lowered through a hole in the ceiling, and there he was. So let me bring that up. If I can do this properly. Okay. And uh, I'll put on my headset so I can make sure that you're getting the sound. Okay. Whoops. There we go. Yours truly has been known to hide for hours. As Sorry, a little premature. Where Jesus was without a doubt held the night before Good Friday on the way to the crucifixion after he was dragged up from Gethsemane. And uh, if no one comes, I will indulge in a Decade of the Divine Mercy Chaplet. 
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now or at the hour of our death. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead on the third day. He rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Eternal Father, I offer thee the body, blood, soul, and divinity of thy dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world, for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world, for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world, for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world, for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world, for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world, for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world, for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world, for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world, for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world, for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer thee the body, blood, soul, and divinity of thy dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer thee the body, blood, soul, and divinity of thy dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, 
Have mercy on us and on the whole world for the sake of this sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer thee the body, blood, soul, and divinity of thy dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who, on the night before the crucifixion, suffered in this very spot after being arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, after being dragged up Mount Zion in chains, suffering continually, being abused continually on the way, such that he would have died on the trip had he not been miraculously sustained by angels, being dragged up the steps outside, which still remain, and cast into this dungeon through a hole, or through a hole in the ceiling, making it utterly impossible for anyone to escape. And there he prayed through what remained of the night until he was dragged from here and presented before Pontius Pilate and Herod and condemned unwillingly by Pontius Pilate to first scourging and then the unspeakable agony of death on the cross. Eternal Father, I offer thee the body, blood, soul, and divinity of thy dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of this sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer thee the body, blood, soul, and divinity of thy dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal God, in whom mercy is endless and the treasure of compassion inexhaustible, Look kindly upon us, and increase your mercy upon us. In difficult moments we might not despair nor become despondent, but with great confidence submit ourselves to thy most holy will, which is love and mercy itself. Amen. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Saint Faustina. Pray for us. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. I'll bring myself back up here. It always takes me a little bit to kind of come down from that. Okay. Okay. Well, I did want to talk a little bit live. Uh, by the way, um, I will keep a little bit of an eye on the chat stream if, if there are any questions or whatever. I don't want to shortchange you too much from the live part of the show. But I have very little to say, but I was going to talk a little bit about the readings from the mass readings from today on the traditional Latin mass inspired in large part by Dom Guerinje's liturgical year. So, and also by the way, I, okay, I went to Novus Ordo mass this morning. Confession, mea culpa, mea culpa. I'm just kidding. And, um, you know, I know many of you go to Novus Ordo masses and they can be really wonderful. But the Mass texts um, are not always, well, they're not as extensive. And uh, the, you know, there are options about what prayers are said and what prayers aren't said and so forth. And so I thought I would go through some of the prayers from the Latin Mass today um, because they're so beautiful and that, you know, you may not have had a chance to hear them today. Or recently. So with that, let me, I'll, I'll just go through the propers. Proper is a fancy word for the prayers that are proper to the day. In other words, that are specific to the day, as opposed to the parts of the Mass that are always in the Mass. So the introit, which is the introductory prayer, is from Galatians. Um, but it behooves us to glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom is our salvation, life, and resurrection, by whom we are saved and delivered. May God have mercy on us and bless us. May he cause the light of his countenance to shine upon us, and may he have mercy on us. But it behooves us to glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom is our salvation, life, and resurrection, by whom we are saved and delivered. Now, the introits normally are a little bit of an Oreo cookie, a little bit of a sandwich, as you see here. There is a passage, um, uh, you know, there's, there's a passage, the first sentence is said, and then there's a passage in the middle, and then the first sentence is repeated. And um, this is kind of neat because we have a, a <laughs> we have an Oreo cookie where the chocolate is Christianity and the uh, white cream is Judaism, right? Because it begins, but it behooves us to glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom is our salvation, life and resurrection, by whom we are saved and delivered, which is a very worthwhile thought to have during Holy Week, because we are going into um, the Passion, and the readings, the gospel readings, starting yesterday, were the different accounts of the Passion. The whole thing from yesterday was Matthew, and today is Mark, and so forth. So we're really dwelling on this horrible, horrible, horrible injustice and cruelty done to Jesus. Uh, that is the cross. And it makes us feel very sorrowful and mournful. But look at what the introit's saying. It behooves us to glory in the cross that we should really simultaneously have kind of contradictory emotions because we have the empathy for Jesus and we have the horror and injustice of what's being done, but it is also his glory and our glory and the source of our salvation, life, and resurrection by which we are saved and delivered. So it's kind of neat that that sets the tone, in a sense, for a, um, for a liturgy, for today's Mass, which is actually all about the crucifixion, all about the Passion of Christ. Then, um, uh, then the next uh, proper prayer is the Collect, the Prayer of the Day, 
and I think this is very similar in the Novus Ordo today, but I'm not 100% sure. Almighty and eternal God, grant us so to celebrate thy mysteries of our Lord's passion that we may deserve to obtain forgiveness through the same Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Okay, so, so we are asking for the grace to celebrate the mysteries of Jesus' passion in such a way that it results in getting the grace to obtain forgiveness for our sins. And that's a really big difference between the spirit of the Novus Ordo and the spirit of the um, traditional Latin Mass, is the traditional Mass is continually repeating how unworthy we are um, of salvation, in fact. How none of us deserve what we have in the grace given us through the Catholic Church to be saved. Whereas the Novus Ordo Mass tends to be more of a celebration of, um, I, I, can I say, how great we are? But in any case, it, it doesn't have the, that, that sense of the unworthiness of receiving what we are receiving and it's more of a celebration of what we are receiving in the context of us uh, deserving it to tell the truth especially with the music but anyway a lot of the hymns are particularly offensive in in you know you know how great we are um anyway uh, I'll put that aside for now. I'm not here to be negative. Those of you who know me know that um, I'm almost never negative. Ha ha ha. Not true. Anyway, okay. Now the um, the epistle, which is really one thing that I wanted. I'll, let me check the chat stream to see if anything's going on. Oh, okay. Mark, uh, remind me if I forget, okay? And also, by the way, remind me about the Mary Multiplier before I go into the um, recording. Let me see what else is here. Okay. 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 Okay, so here's the um, Old Testament reading, the Epistle reading. It's from Jeremiah, and it's really wonderful. And as a matter of fact, I'll, I'll just, um, I'll read it. And then I will read what Dom Guerin Jay said about it because, and I'll talk about that. Um, okay, it's from chapter 11 of Jeremiah. In those days, Jeremiah said, Thou, O Lord, hast shown me, and I have known. Then thou showest me their doings. And I was as meek as I, and I was as a meek lamb that is carried to be a victim. And I knew not that they had devised counsels against me, saying, Let us put wood on his bread, and cut him off from the land of the living, and let his name be remembered no more. But thou, O Lord of hosts, who judges justly, and tries the reins and the hearts, let me see thy revenge on them, for to thee I have revealed my cause, O Lord my God. Now, of course, Jeremiah is a figure of Jesus suffering unjustly. And as he says here, as a meek lamb, as a meek lamb that is carried to be a victim. That's, of course, quite a direct echo of Jesus. And now I'm going to go into Dom Geringer's comment. Again, we have the plaintive words of Jeremiah. He gives us the very words used by his enemies when they conspired his death. It is evident, however, that the prophet is here the figure of one greater than himself. Let us, says this, excuse me, let us, say these enemies, put wood upon his bread. That is, let us put poisonous wood into what he eats, so that we may cause his death. This is the literal sense of these words, as applied to the prophet. But how much more truly were they fulfilled in our Redeemer? He tells us that his divine flesh is the true bread that came down from heaven. This bread, the body of the man-god, is bruised, torn, and wounded. The Jews nail it to the wood. 
so that in a manner it is made one with the wood, and the wood is all covered with Jesus' blood. This Lamb of God was immolated on the wood of the cross. It is by his immolation that we have had given to us a sacrifice which is worthy of God, and it is by this sacrifice that we participate in the bread of heaven, the flesh of the Lamb, our true Passover, our true Passover Lamb. So you see what um, what <laughs> what is being done here in the Mass in this text. Jeremiah said that um, his enemies said, "Let us put wood on his bread and cut him off from the land of the living, and let his name be remembered no more." And this was a figure of Jesus's crucifixion, because Jesus is the bread of life, the true bread that came down from heaven the bread that gives us salvation, and the wood, the wood was laid on him. The wood was nailed, was nailed to the bread of life. So instead of the wood on the bread given to Jeremiah to uh, cause his death, we have the wood nailed to the bread of life that has opened the way of eternal life to us. So we have the bread of life, but not just the bread of life separated from the wood, but the bread of life on the wood. Make sense? Very beautiful. Um, okay. Now, I think the only other, the only other, oh, well, I, I'm always dishonest, right? Because I always say more than I, um, that I uh, say I'm going to. Okay. I, I want to say the um, preface from the traditional Latin Mass for uh, Holy Week, actually for most of Lent. Maybe all of Lent, I don't remember. Uh, and it's probably pretty close to the Novus Ordo preface, but I'm not 100% sure. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, the Novus Ordo Mass gives the priest an option in what... Um, what preface is said so i just want to this this preface of the holy cross is so beautiful here goes it is truly meet and just right and for our salvation that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee o holy lord father almighty everlasting god who did establish the salvation of mankind on the tree of the cross that from where death came there also life might arise again, and that he who overcame by the tree, by the tree also might be overcome, through Christ our Lord, through whom the angels praise thy majesty, the dominion, dominations worship it, the powers stand in awe, etc. Okay, so um, God established the salvation of mankind on the tree of the cross, so that from where death came, because death came from the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, right? When Adam and Eve sinned, uh, from, from where death came, that is a tree, life might also arise again. In other words, the, the remedy for the death that came from the tree should also come from a tree. And that he, that is Satan, who overcame by the tree, in other words, conquered mankind, so to speak, uh, by the tree, may by the tree might also be overcome, because of course it was by the cross that Satan was definitively defeated. So, worth repeating, even though it's probably old hat to most of you, or maybe even all of you. So, that's um, probably all I will... Um, do from the Mass for up today. Um, what is that? I thought I silenced it, but I obviously didn't. My church bell's going. So let me uh, silence my church bells. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, now, uh, the question on the uh, chat stream was, let me look it up, let me scroll back to it, from Mark, 
Luke 23, or Luke 23, verse 31, if they act thus cruelly and shamefully while the tree of their natural life is still green, how much worse will they be when the wood is dry? Very interesting. Thank you. I don't know if, if you're the straight man feeding me these lines, Mark, but yes, because it actually gets to the issue of the conversion of the Jews that is a necessity for the second coming. And I do not have Romans 11 in front of me. So let me, um, let me actually um, disappear. Uh, how, I don't know how I can do that, actually. I'm not sure I want to disappear. Okay, I'll just walk over to my bookshelf and, and pull out a scripture. Okay. So, okay. So that is Luke 21, 23. And I will go back to Romans 11, which is kind of my bread and butter. And this is, this is um, why God failed the eyes of the Jews to not recognize Christ when he came. And he says, if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, in other words, if the Jews' rejection of Christ meant the salvation of the world, the reconciliation of the world with God through Christ, which could not have happened properly if the Jews had entered the church first time around. Uh, the church wouldn't have spread properly among the Gentiles. That's what this whole section is about. So the rejection of the Jews was necessary for the church to spread properly throughout the world, the Gentile world. And then St. Paul says here in Romans eleven fifteen, for if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Okay. And then at the end of chapter 11, uh, Paul says, I want you to understand this mystery, brethren. A hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles come in, and then all Israel will be saved. Okay, so that is the source of the statement in the Catechism, uh, the dogmatic statement in the Catechism, that, quote, Paragraph 674, the glorious Messiah's coming is suspended at every moment of history until his recognition by all Israel. So, if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? So, here is where I'm going with this. I think that when Paul says this, and then he goes on to say, when the full number of the Gentiles come in, then all Israel will be saved. What he is saying, because there's another element we know that's dogma about the second coming, which is the second coming will be preceded by the great apostasy, by a falling away of the faith, by the people in the church, the great apostasy, disastrous. You know, every, uh, not everyone, but most of the people who were seriously Christian will cease to be seriously Christian. Remember, Jesus said, and when the Son of Man returns, will he even find faith left on the face of the earth? So weaving them all together, I think when St. Paul says, if, um, if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? His image of life from the dead is the image of, if men are like this when the wood is green, what will they be like when the wood is dry? Okay, so... When Jesus came, the wood was green. Man, man had love. Man, man was, was, you know, look at how eagerly the Gentiles flooded into the church, how eagerly they accepted Jesus. The wood was green. But near the end of time, the wood will be dry. The spirituality will have tremendously faded. Right? And so, so I think that the Jews coming into the church uh, after the great apostasy, the falling away of the Gentiles, the Jews coming into the church will be an infusion of new sap, so to speak, into the wood, and that'll be life from the dead. And then the church composed of Jew and Gentile will be ready for the second coming, 
the Gentile world, which was full of sap and green, so to speak, at the beginning of Christianity, will have grown dry like dead wood. But the Jews coming into the church will be the life, um, uh, what, what's the words uh, um, in uh, here, um, a life from the dead. What will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? There. So, so that's what I think is meant there when he says, what will man be like when the wood is dry? He's kind of referring to the great apostasy. There's also someone, if Moises is watching, he can tell me. Uh, there's a place where Jesus says, man's love will grow cold. You know where that is? Do I, you know, do I have to, do I have to kind of <laughs> Google it? I could find it very easily, but he's talking about the end times and he says, man's love will grow cold. And so that's the, uh, I, that's what I think that if man is like this, when the wood is green, what will they be like when the wood is dry is a reference to the drying up of faith, the drying up of love. I, I'm going to go further, even the drying up of what it means to be a human person, which I think we see in our day. I think that people are not people the way people were even 50, 60 years ago. I'm serious. I am serious. I mean, I mean, uh, 50 years ago, let's go back to the 1950s, which is now like 75 years ago, 70 years ago. People's word meant something. Remember, you could do a deal by a handshake, seriously. If, if um, you, you, I mean, if somebody agreed to something, that was it. If, in, if, unless they were low life, but a normal person. Now, um, uh, well, I'm getting personal. I always get personal. I gave up management consulting. My last client had promised me a certain amount of shares if, you know, in payment for uh, the work I was doing for his company. And I did the work for his company. And when it came time to pay me the shares, he gave me one third of what he had promised. And he laughed at me. He actually laughed at me. He said, you didn't really expect me to give you what I said I was going to give you, did you? In other words, he was totally shameless about it. And in fact, when he when I started that consulting assignment, I talked to the VP of sales, and who warned me not to believe what the president had said, the you know, president of a company had said. And I thought the VP of sales was like being horribly cynical, but he wasn't. He was just being contemporary. And I was still, you know, lost in the 1960s or something. Um, so, uh, I, yes, the, 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 the sense of self, the integrity of the human person, I think, has tremendously um, degraded. You know where else you see that? You see that in fornication, okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm really on a tear now, aren't I? You see that in fornication because, because um, fornication is a tremendous violation of the human person on both sides, but perhaps even more so on the woman's side. In other words, if one has a strong sense of self, intimate relations are not a joke, and intimate relations are not simply a source of pleasure. The person is involved. The human person is involved. Um, and everybody on some deep level feels that, feels the violation of fornication if it's not in a permanent relationship, a really permanent relationship. But, but people are completely oblivious to it. I mean, deep down inside they feel it, but on the surface they are oblivious to it. And, and, and yeah, I mean, you have fornication, you have pornography, you have, um, you have, um, solitary sexual gratification, I'll say, and which if I, if a person had a sense of their personhood, these would not be, um, you know, goes without saying normal things to do. So anyway. So um, that's what I think. The wood is very dry now. <laughs> okay, the wood is dry. Um, oh yeah, abortion. 
for a mother to kill the child in her womb. I mean, what dry wood? I mean, the whole abortion movement for women to be marching in the streets, you know, saying our bodies ourselves and, you know, this is our, the, you know, you're, you're insulting to my integrity to tell me I can't kill the baby in the womb. There is something very strange going on with the sense of one's own humanity right now. So anyway, thank you, Mark, for that question. You let me get up on my soapbox. I'm going to do a Mary multiplier, and then I'm going to go to a repeat of yesterday's show. So um, if you watch yesterday's repeat of the 2021 show, um, you may want to tune out. But thank you very much for tuning in. I do expect to have a show tomorrow, normal time. And um, I expect to do it live. In other words, I'm not going to use some regurgitation from the past unless something happens that really ties me up tomorrow. And I think what I want, because tomorrow's Spy, Spy Wednesday. It's, it's, it's a, I mean, traditionally, it's the day that Judas went to the priests and agreed to turn Jesus over. I don't know. Maybe I'll recycle something and also talk. I don't know what I'll do, but it's going to be a Holy Week show. Today was one hour earlier than the normal time. Uh, my normal time used to be three o'clock. Um, uh, do you prefer four o'clock? I can do four o'clock. Should I do four o'clock? Maybe I'll do four o'clock tomorrow. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, stay posted. Don't forget, by the way, that the time changed here. So, anyway, I can't even figure out what direction it is. But anyway, Eastern Daylight Time is, uh, is what is the show is posted in terms of Eastern Daylight Time. So if you're in Europe or something, you may have to figure out what time it is today in New York City. That'll give you Eastern Daylight Time. Okay, goodbye. I babble too much. Oh, Mary Multiplier. So let's think of an intention to um, appeal to the Blessed Virgin Mary to give us each the grace, the credit of each of the Hail Marys that we say for each of our intentions. So... Okay. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You have your your intention locked and loaded. Ready, aim, fire. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Okay. Bye for now. See you tomorrow. At least I'll be here. Either three o'clock or four o'clock. I'll put it on the show card, of course. And I'll go back to the opening screen. And um, let me make this a little bit neater. Okay, so I'll go back to the opening screen. And I will start the um, same Harper Day hymn. Whoops. Gloria laus et honor tibisit Rex Christe Redemptor Cui pue Never mind. I forgot about playing that show. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Boy, I'm hopeless. Okay. Okay, never mind. I, I, uh, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. My brain is not working these days. Okay.
I'm here. I'll play the show that I played, um, that I played yesterday. So, so I, if, if you want to stay around and see the show that where I go through what Jesus did and taught on Monday of Holy week and Tuesday of Holy week, uh, it's a very good discussion of that. It's 80 minutes long. And, um, let me bring it up for you. And, uh, and then I will disappear as that comes on. So, um, let me see. Oh, here it is. Maybe. Yes, here it is. Okay, here I am. And, um, so I'll shrink to the corner and I'll bring up the teaching on what Jesus taught and did and said in the teachings, uh, during holy, the first two days of Holy Week. I want to go through what Jesus did yesterday, today, um, and what he taught yesterday and today, because it's also actually at the heart of the relationship between uh, Jesus and certainly the Jewish leaders. So anyway, um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read the brief description of these three days from Dom Guéranger, who was a very holy Benedictine abbot about 100 years ago, who wrote a wonderful work called the Liturgical Year, where he goes through the Catholic liturgy day by day throughout the year with both the mass readings and with the um, and with the meditations on it. And uh, I, I, I will be sticking to his chronology of these few days. There are very slight differences um, between even between some of the synoptic gospels, in particular, what day did Jesus ch uh, chase the money changers out of the temple? Um, and uh, there, one of the synoptics makes it sound like it's the day before Palm Sunday. Another one of the synoptics makes it sound like it's the day after Palm Sunday. Uh, the Gospel of John, I believe, makes it sound like it's earlier in Jesus's ministry. And according to Anne Catherine Emmerich, a number of these things were done more than once. So that is obviously a, a possible explanation for the apparent contradiction. Um, okay, so all that being said, let me uh, start with Dom Guéranger's chronology of these three days, or these two days, actually. This morning, that's Monday morning of Holy Week, yesterday morning. Also, Jesus goes with his disciples to Jerusalem. He is fasting, for the gospel tells us that he was hungry. He approaches a fig tree, which is by the wayside, but finding nothing on it except leaves, Jesus, wishing to give us an instruction, curses the fig tree, which immediately withers away. The allusion to Jerusalem is evident. This city is zealous for the exterior of divine worship, but her heart is hard and obstinate, and she is plotting at this very hour the death of Jesus, the Son of God. The greater portion day is spent in the temple where Jesus holds long conversations with the chief priests and ancients of the people. His language to them is stronger than ever and triumphs over all their captious questions. It is principally in the Gospel of St. Matthew that we shall find these answers of our Redeemer, which so energetically accuse the Jewish leaders of their sin and of rejecting the Messiah, and so plainly foretell the punishment their sin is to bring after it. At length, Jesus leaves the temple and takes the road that leads to Bethany. Having come as far as Mount Olivet, which commands a view of Jerusalem, he sits down and rests a while. The disciples take this opportunity of asking him how soon the chastisements he has been speaking of in the temple will come upon the city. His answer comprises two events, the destruction of Jerusalem and the final destruction of the world. He thus teaches them that the first is a figure of the second. The time when each is to happen is to be when the measure of iniquity is filled up. But with regard to the chastisement that is to befall Jerusalem, he gives them this more definite answer. Amen, I say to you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. 
History tells us how this prophecy of Jesus was fulfilled. Forty years had scarcely elapsed after his ascension when the Roman army encamped on this very place where he is now speaking to his disciples and laid siege to the ungrateful and wicked city. After giving a prophetic description of that last judgment, which is to rectify all the unjust judgments of men, he leaves Mount Olivet, returns to Bethany, and consoles the anxious heart of his most holy mother. Now, that is uh, Dom Geringer's description of Monday. But in fact, the events on Monday that took place on Monday and that took place on Tuesday are not clearly delineated in the Gospels. They run together. So it's not clear which of the parables he gave on Monday and which he gave on Tuesday, with the exception of the story of the fig tree, because um, it is recounted, and I'll read that, that passage from Tuesday morning. On the road from Bethany to Jerusalem, the disciples are surprised at seeing the fig tree, which their divine master had yesterday cursed, now dead. Addressing himself to Jesus, Peter says, Rabbi, behold the fig tree which thou didst curse is withered away. In order to teach us that the whole of material nature is subservient to the spiritual element, when this last is united to God by faith, Jesus replies, have the faith of God. Amen, amen, I say to you, that whoever shall say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, and shall not stagger in his heart, but believe that whatsoever he saith shall be done, it shall be done unto him. So that is actually the only event that is clearly on Tuesday rather than on Monday of Holy Week, because of course it's a day after he cursed the fig tree. Now, and obviously the fig tree being cursed and the leaves withering is a picture of the end of sacramental Judaism, the end of the Jewish sacramental covenant. It's the actually a picture of the end of the presence, the central presence of God within the Judaism, within, of course, the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, within the uh, Jewish sacraments, such as they were. And that, that fig tree does represent Judaism. And in fact, the whole story of these two days is, um, if you forgive me for being a little bit informal, as anti-Semitic as, as Jesus ever gets. It's not really anti-Semitic, of course. It's correctly reproving the uh, abusiveness of the Jewish leaders, their hypocrisy, and their failure to actually follow uh, the spirit of Judaism for sure, but actually even also the law of Judaism. So I will go into that now. I'll be reading from uh, the Gospel of Matthew. Um, thank you for your comments, by the way. It's tremendously, tremendously consoling. Um, it's just wonderful. Usually I do radio shows and I, I don't know if anyone's listening. Now I know that someone's listening. Anyway, um, what was I saying? Oh, yes. Uh, Jesus spends these two days largely condemning the Jewish leadership for their hypocrisy, for their having, you know, it's a temptation that man always has, which is to steal God. It's, it's called spiritual vainglory, but to basically take credit ourselves for God's work and to place ourselves actually on the throne of God one way or another. This appears already actually quite a bit in the Old Testament. Uh, it's actually it's in the story of um, of Elisha actually um, already in the Old Testament, and it's clearly the story of the Jewish hierarchy at the time of Jesus. They put themselves in the throne of God. They they became in their own minds the object of the worship of the people, and um, kind of placed themselves as a as a wall between the people who were responding, trying to respond to God. And they placed themselves in the middle of that response and took it for themselves. Now, I'm going to be reading all of these parables and talking about how deeply they condemn the Jewish hierarchy. I think most of you know that I'm, I'm Jewish in origin and I think still Jewish, although I'm in the Catholic Church. Uh, so I just wanted to say in defense of Judaism, I'll only say it briefly. 
Um, but, you know, you know, we Catholics are not in a position to cast stones. You know, we live in a little bit of a glass house right now. When you look at the behavior of some of the Catholic religious leaders and how they have placed themselves, basically taken for themselves glory and honor and even in some sense worship and certainly authority and prerogatives that belong to God and not to them as human beings, as men. Um, and so it's easy to see the corruption of the Jewish hierarchy at the time of Jesus and, you know, hold it up side by side with the corruption that's all too evident, actually, all too prevalent in the Catholic hierarchy today and see perhaps one as a foreshadowing of the other. So anyway, having said that, let me go into Jesus's condemnation of the Jewish hierarchy of his day. I'll start reading from uh, Matthew 26, but first let me just take a glance at the comments to see what's going on. Okay. Okay. Okay, I, they're wonderful comments and I wish I had uh, the time to make, um, uh, <laughs> I love your comments. Um, to, I'll, I'll respond to one about the Sadducees and what was going on with the Sadducees because they do appear in these two chap chapters of uh, Matthew. Uh, the Sadducees did not believe in life after death. They only took seriously the first five books of the Jewish scriptures. That's called the Torah. That's Genesis through Deuteronomy. They rejected the uh, prophets as not being scriptural, not being inspired by God, and they rejected the wisdom literature, that's the Psalms, the wisdom of Solomon, and so forth. So they only held to the first five books. There isn't a clear teaching about the afterlife in the first five books. Um, there isn't, uh, they actually rejected other aspects of the supernatural. They were very uh, modernist in a sense. Uh, you know, they, they did not like the idea of miracles. They did not like the idea of angels and they rejected anything they could, like the teaching about the afterlife. So if you ever want to keep straight who the Pharisees were and who the Sadducees are were, just remember that the Sadducees were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection of the body. They didn't believe in the afterlife. So there, I've said it. You'll never forget which ones were the Sadducees. Um, the Sadducees were very influenced by Greek, the Greeks, actually. I mean, in other words, uh, the world of the Jews was under Greek influence for about four or five centuries by that point, at least three centuries. And a lot of Judaism had kind of strayed towards the Greek way of thinking and the Sadducees represented that. Anyway, Matthew 21. Um, so this is, this is now um, the day after Palm Sunday. It's, it's Monday morning. In the morning, as Jesus was returning to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but leaves only. And he said to it, may, ne, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, how did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered them, truly I say to you, if you have faith and never doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. And when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I also will ask you a question. And if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where did it come from? from heaven or from men? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, but why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we are afraid of the multitude for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. By the way, this, these two chapters are absolutely wonderful not only for the parables, but just for 
I don't know what to say, the personality of Jesus, the, the, the um, repartee of Jesus, the way Jesus always cuts his opposers down to size in, in such a kind of witty and surgical and apropos way. Um, again, we have some contemporary examples in at least in our, in our American politics some that some of us enjoy. But it's very beautiful to see uh, the right gain such a clear hand over these captious um, people who are always asking gotcha questions and trying to lay traps. Anyway, back to uh, 2000 years ago. Jesus goes into his first parable. What do you think? Remember, he's speaking to the same, the same uh, Jewish leaders who were already engaging him and giving him a hard time. And let me interject something. Jesus, we know without a doubt that at this point in time, the Jewish leadership, the Sanhedrin, had actually already passed a death sentence on Jesus. It's total hypocrisy that they're pretending to evaluate him. They have literally already passed the death sentence. Um, of course, Jesus knows that because he knows everything. We know it from several places in the scriptures. Let me see if I made notes about this. Um, oh, yes, in John 11.45, um, maybe I'll go to it now. Um, uh, in John 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 45, um, it says, uh, okay, I'll, I'll read that passage. This is right after the resurrection of Lazarus from the tomb, right? Um, Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him because they saw that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Um, and some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do for this man performs many signs? If we let him go on thus, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. You do not understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people and the whole nation should not perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation and not for the nation only, but to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they took counsel how to put him to death, okay? So the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council met and already were not discussing whether they should put Jesus to death, but exactly how and when they should put him to death. This actually wasn't the first death sentence passed on Jesus. We see that already in John 9, but I won't go into that now. But there's actually a clear indication in John 9 that the Sanhedrin had already met and pass the death sentence on Jesus. So anyway, so this is the context. Jesus is, of course, seeing straight through these people and that he knows the depths of their hypocrisy. Um, so back to the parable. What do you think? A man had two sons and he went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And the son answered, I will not. And afterward, he repented and went. And he went to the second son and said the same thing. And the second son answered, I go, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? They said the first. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the harlots believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward repent and believe him. Now, let me interject something here. Let me look at these wonderful comments first. Um, okay, I will, I will just answer one of these little comments, which is uh, somebody who said they wish they could now see yesterday's teaching. You can't see it because I gave up because there was no sound. So I didn't even record it. So I am giving yesterday's teaching today along with today's teaching. So you are hearing yesterday's teaching. Now, let me go back to this parable of the two sons, one who said, oh, yes, father, I'll do what you say, but doesn't do it. And the other son who started out saying, nah, forget it, but changed his mind and actually did the will of the father. Now, Jesus explains this 
as talking about the Jewish leadership being the son who was claimed to be obedient but was disobedient and the tax collectors and the harlots being the son who started out disobedient but became obedient. Of course he's right. But I'll remember something else, which is at this point in time, Jesus's ministry was 100% to the Jewish world. When he sent out his disciples, he said, go nowhere among the pagans, go to no town of the Samaritans, go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So it was not yet time for Jesus to be telling them openly that basically it's the Gentiles who would be coming into the church. It's the Gentiles who would be becoming loyal followers of Jesus. And the Jewish nation by and large, tragically, would follow their leaders and reject Jesus. So what I'm saying is that looking back from later in history, it's clear that the son who first said, I won't go, but afterwards repented and decided to obey his father, that's the Gentiles. That's all of the, that's the non-Jewish world who by and large accepted the gospel and came into the church. We see this, of course, in the book of Acts and in the letters of Paul and so forth. We all know that, that the entire Gentile world was much more responsive to the gospel than the Jews were. And the Jews were the son who started out saying, yes, father, whatever you say, I'm sure to do, and then turned their back on him. So anyway, obviously the father being God. So anyway, okay, great. So that's the first. The got, you know, kind of gotcha that Jesus gives to the Jewish leadership, pointing out that the ones that should have been most loyal to him were the ones that betrayed him. Then he goes on to an even better parable, so to speak, um, uh, certainly a, a more elaborate parable. Um, here, another parable. There was a householder who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to tenants and went into another country. When the season of fruit drew, drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Afterward, he sent his son to them, saying, they will surely respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir, come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Wow, okay. So remember, he's saying this to the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders, and it couldn't be more clear, right? The prophets, the Jews, of course, knew the Old Testament. They, they knew the prophets. They knew the story of Jeremiah and the prophets and how, who was it, um, Zechariah was killed on his way to the altar and so forth. They were aware that it was the Jewish leadership that tended to stone and kill the prophets because they were telling them things they didn't want to hear. So, so uh, this parable is very obvious to them. Now we come to the time when, okay, so what's God going to do? He sent the prophets to get you guys to, you know, stand up and fly right. But, you know, you, you just stoned them and left them in a well to die and everything. What's he going to do? He's going to send his own son. Surely they will respect my son. That's, of course, Jesus, right? Who they already know, call himself the son of God. So he's, you know, he's clearly talking about himself. Okay. And what do they say? What, what do the tenants, the evil tenants of the, of the orchard do? They say, not only will they not even listen to the son, but, oh, this is the heir, right? This isn't just a messenger from the owner. This is actually the heir. So if we kill him, we no longer just get to be crooked tenants, but we'll actually own the vineyard. So you see how you see that the Jewish leadership is, is stealing the throne of God is what they're doing. By the way, again, you know, I leave it to you whether you want to see a parallel here with the current 
leadership of the church, at least in part, of stealing the throne of God for themselves. But anyway, that Jesus is giving it to them between the eyes, no holes barred, that that's what they're doing. They're plotting to kill the heir so that there's no one who can, can stand in the way of their theft of God, essentially, the theft of the throne of God. So anyway, so uh, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. I mean, no one ever called Jews dumb, excuse me for that comment, okay? Of course they could tell he was talking about them. So, you know, they're just getting, you know, more and more steamed up. They were already plotting to kill him. And I think because they were already plotting to kill him, and of course, because this is already Holy Week, um, you know, Jesus has left all politeness behind in a sense. I mean, all indirection, all, all you know, like, like tactful soft peddling. And it's just, this is the moment for the unvarnished truth. And he's giving them the unvarnished truth. And he's giving us the unvarnished truth, thanks be to God. So when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. But when they tried to arrest him, they feared the multitudes because they held him to be a prophet. Okay? So they're already out to kill him. The, the whole trial was a total kangaroo court on, on the night before the crucifixion, by the way. And maybe I'll have a chance to give a teaching on that. Um, maybe on Good Friday or something. I, I, this is so wonderful. I can tell. I mean, the fact that you you like these um, and that people are actually watching. Now that I know people are watching, of course, I'll have to do this more. Um, but anyway, um, so the, the whole thing was a kangaroo court. They've already decided to kill him. They're all, the only question is, how can we do this? Because the multitudes like him. And that's where tomorrow comes in, actually. That's where Spy Wednesday comes in. Um, that, Wednesday of Holy Week traditionally is called Spy Wednesday because it's the day when the Jewish leadership was plotting, okay, how are we going to get rid of this guy? And just when they were pulling their hair out, trying to figure out a way, uh, Judas Iscariot shows up and offers to betray Jesus. That's why it's called Spy Wednesday. And that's basically the story of tomorrow. So anyway, uh, they, they wanted to arrest him, but they feared the multitudes because the multitudes held him to be a prophet. So then, you know, Jesus doesn't run and hide. He gives them another one of these wonderful parables, all saying the same thing again, but just in such powerful ways. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a marriage feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the marriage feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, look, I have made ready my dinner. My oxen and my fat cal calves are killed and everything is ready. Come to the marriage feast. But they made light of it and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully and killed them. So again, we have the same story of, of the prophets being um, killed, trying to announce the good news, so to speak. While the, um, the king was angry and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the thoroughfares and invite to the marriage feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. And so the wedding hall was filled with guests. But And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. There men will weep and gnash their teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Okay, so let me go through this a little bit. Um, obviously... The original invited guests were the Jews. They were the chosen people. They were given this promise as the children of Abraham, right? Jesus came to them first. Uh, but what did they do? When God sent the prophets, they rejected and killed the prophets. And then when God invited them to the marriage feast, so now we're already, we have a foretaste of the church already, okay? We have the marriage feast. We not only have God sending his son 
to fallen mankind, but he's having God send his son and invite them to union with God, which is, of course, the marriage feast, which is which is actually the indwelling Holy Trinity. It's the it's the it, that's what it is, actually. It's it's God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit living in the temples of our hearts. That's pretty darn big. And um, that's what God was inviting first the Jewish people to, but they were too busy with other things, right? There was money to be made, excuse me. You can send me comments saying, please don't be anti-Semitic or whatever, that's okay. I'm not anti-Semitic. I just, I'm, I don't know how to put it. Just, you know what I mean. I don't have a filter over how I see the world, I guess. Anyway, anyway, so the Jews were the ones saying, you know, they made light of it, they trivialized it, they went off to their farm, to their business, and the ones who were left behind seized the messengers, right, and uh, and treated them shamefully and killed them, and of course didn't go to the wedding feast. Okay, so then the king is angry, he sends troops and destroys the murderers and burns their city. Now, of course, it's true that um, Jerusalem was burned to the ground horribly, about uh, 40 years after the crucifixion of Christ, the king, God, did send troops to their city, that is Jerusalem, the center of, Ju of Judaism, and burned it to the ground and actually killed all the Jews there too. So that was literally fulfilled. Let me just make a little, little side trip here, which is we see something here, which we see over and over again in the Old Testament and the New Testament, which is everything that happens is divine providence that god does what he wants to do what he plans to do and very often the agents of those horrible things that are part of his divine providence the chastisements and the punishments and the wake-up calls that involve a lot of suffering he uses the agency of evil people He's not using saints to bring about the divine providence of wars, of the destruction of Jerusalem, of the exile of the northern kingdom of Israel into Assyria. He, he raised up the king of Assyria, you know, one of the wickedest people in history, as a rod, as a scourge to chastise his people. That's explicit in the Old Testament. Here he's using the Roman troops as a rod to chastise and punish the Jewish people. And uh, we have the coronavirus right now. I know there's a little bit of a digression. Um, uh, we have terrible suffering. Um, we have the suffering of the uh, pandemic, they're calling it itself. And then as Catholics, we have this horrible additional suffering of being deprived of the sacraments. And this has come about Maybe it's an accident. Maybe it's the action of irresponsible people, or maybe it's the action of evil people. And there are people who don't have three heads, who aren't crazy, who think that this virus was, you know, man-made, was intentionally modified to be as destructive as possible. And maybe it escaped accidentally, uh, or may, uh, maybe it was a bioweapon that was engineered and escaped accidentally, or maybe it was actually intentionally released. This, I'm just presenting that as a hypothetical possibility. What, however evil the intention was behind it, it falls within divine providence. Obviously, the world needs a chastisement, you know, and God uses evil people to bring about his chastisements. That's just my point. So don't look at it and say, you know, what a shame. God has no role in this just because it was evil people who did that. Same thing with the deprivation of the sacraments. If bishops somewhere, some, somewhere in the world made an unnecessary call and deprived the faithful of the sacraments because they were deficient in their own faith, however incorrect that decision may have been, maybe however wicked it may have been, I'm not saying any of them were, but even hypothetically, if they actually were maliciously made decisions. That doesn't change the fact that the outcome is part of divine providence and it's part of the chastisement that God has sent us. So he has sent us a double chastisement. 
He has sent the world a worldly chastisement that deprives them of their source of income, of their entertainments, of their freedom in many countries. Um, you know, it's impoverished much of the world and it's going to be even worse. So he sent this one brilliant dual chastisement, a worldly chastisement for the worldly and a spiritual chastisement for the spiritual. Okay. Again, I, I mean, you, you don't get wiser or smarter or cleverer than, than God. Okay. So anyway, back to this. So that, that was all a digression about him having sent the Roman troops to destroy the city. If you remember where we were. Okay. So then the king said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the thoroughfares and invite to the marriage feast as many as you find there. And those servants went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. Okay, so this is clearly the Gentiles. Okay, the, the uh, original offer was to the Jews, the chosen people. They rejected that offer. So then, um, then the king orders his servants to go out into the streets, the hoi polloi, the good and bad, the unwashed, um, the not the chosen people, um, and invite them to the wedding feast to take the place of the original intended honored guests, those for the Jews. So now we have the church, this, this completely open-handed invitation to every human being on earth to the wedding feast, right? To the indwelling Holy Trinity that I mentioned, which comes through Christianity and in its ultimate form, it comes through being a Catholic, a sacramental Catholic in a state of grace, okay? So what happens then? So the king came in to look at the guests, but he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. There men will weep and gnash their teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Um, the um, I'm going to leave the comments. They're, they're just too wonderful to watch. I don't want to get distracted. So you can, you can all share them, obviously. I'll try to restrain myself, mortify myself. Um, so what's going on there? Very often people think, oh, this sounds kind of unfair. You know, this, this guy gets invited into the wedding feast and just because he wasn't wearing the wedding garment, you know, didn't have a wedding garment to wear or whatever, you know, how did he get in here? And he gets essentially thrown into hell. Um, but let me tell you what's going on. Okay. Remember the wedding feast is the union of the human soul with God. What do, you know, we are uh, born in a state of sin. Uh, in the old days, maybe even today, it depends if you're an adult when you get baptized or when a baby is baptized. Babies get baptized dressed in you know white garments. Adults, when they used to get baptized, uh, were given a pure white garment when they came out of the baptismal waters as a symbol of their new purity. Um, a white garment is a symbol of of purity. It's a symbol of virginity, by the way, which is why traditionally it was, a, you know, what, the, you know, the, the, the bride would always wear white. So that white garment is actually being in a state of grace. It's no, it's being in a state of grace um, first by baptism, but also being in a state of grace by a repenting of our sins, basically. We sin continually. We know that. But we have the sacrament of confession. It takes nothing to be forgiven of our sins, to be re-purified, to be re-baptized, so to speak. All we have to do is, is um, be sorry for our sins, go to sacramental confession, and have a firm purpose of amendment. In other words, really have the desire to sin less and not sin again. And we come out of that confessional after we've done our penance or whatever with that white garment again in that state of grace with the indwelling most holy trinity as guests at the wedding banquet, okay? If we fall in a mud puddle and lose the wedding garment, 
all we have to do is go to confession again and we get it back again. However, woe be to us if we find ourselves at the wedding feast, so to speak, without that white, white wedding garment. In other words, not in a state of grace. If we die not in a state of grace, uh, if we die with mortal sin on our souls, we are in serious, serious, serious mud puddle, okay? And that's why the end of this is, um, I'll just repeat that. When the king came in to look at his guests, okay? So this is the, this is the uh, personal judgment. This is a particular judgment. He saw there a man who had no wedding garment, who was not in a state of grace. And he said to him, friend, what are you doing here without a wedding garment? He was speechless. He was horrified. He was shocked. And he said to his attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. There men will weep and gnash their teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Okay. So he lost his redemption. Okay. He sent out. Uh, I think probably to damnation. Well, maybe one can make an argument to purgatory. I'll leave that up to you. He certainly cast out of the wedding feast, for many are called, but few are chosen. However, we were all given the opportunity to have a wedding garment. Okay. <laughs> I mean, all of us, because you're watching this show. The, the situation with people who don't have the grace, the favor to know the truth of the Catholic faith. We can put them in another category for now. But certainly Catholics who know better and know how to get that wedding garment at will and know what their duty and their obligations are, if they show up at the wedding feast without a wedding garment, it's not going to be a happy day. So anyway, um, okay, sorry. Um, so anyway, so back to Jesus' parables. So anyway, he just gave this parable again uh, an obvious condemnation of um, the Jews' rejection of Jesus, the Jews' rejection of God, their Jews' rejection of Jesus, and therefore the promise uh, that was given to the Jews being extended to all of mankind, the Gentiles. So the very next verse, I'm on, on Matthew 22, verse 15. I may not even get through Matthew today. Um, uh, I'll probably run over, by the way. And this is, this is uh, uh, my understanding is that this, uh, after the live broadcast, is still available, um, you know, as a recording on the YouTube channel. So, you know, if you tune out after an hour, you can always pick up after, laterwards, later, afterwards, later. Um, so um, the very next verse, uh, this is uh, Matthew twenty two fifteen. Then the Pharisees went and took counsel how to entangle him in his talk. See, now it's getting serious. They have to find some landmines to place before him because he's getting away with murder, right? So they have to trap him. They have to come up with a gotcha question at the press conference, so to speak. Then the Pharisees went and took counsel how to entangle him in his talk. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully and care for no man, for you do not regard the position of men. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Of course, because they were trying to trap him, because if they um, said pay taxes to Caesar, they, were, uh, they could accuse him of making Caesar the king, whereas you're not supposed to have any king but God alone. And if they said, um, don't pay taxes to Caesar, they could accuse him in front of the uh, Roman authorities as being essentially an insurrectionist because they were, Jesus was recommending that people not pay their taxes. So they thought this was a pretty clever trap, right? Um, tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the money for the tax. And they brought him a coin. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is that? They said, Caesar's. So he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the thing that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. 
So not only did Jesus avoid getting trapped, but he actually, you know, gave a very beautiful teaching about the difference between having no king but God, what that means, having no sovereign over one's soul but God, versus the things of this world that do belong to the authorities of this world. So, wow, he's pretty good. Um, okay, so, so that was the turn of the Herodians and the Pharisees. Okay, now it's the turn of the Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection. So they're going to trap Jesus with an unanswerable question about the resurrection. The same day Sadducees came to him who say there is no resurrection, and they asked him a question saying, Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, and having no children, left his wife to his brother. So to the second and the third, down to the seventh. After them all, the woman died in the resurrection. Therefore, to which of the seven will she be wife? For they all had her. But Jesus answered them, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. I have no intention to become political, okay? But we do have a political figure now in the United States who was famous for calling himself a counterpuncher. He waited until people attacked him before he would attack anybody, but then he would hit them twice as hard. And we see in these parables, I'm afraid, that Jesus is a counterpuncher, okay? Whenever these people attack him, he doubles, doubles down in his response. And his response not only deflects and neutralizes the attack, but actually doubles the counterattack. And we see that here, right? Because first, the issue of whose wife will she be, he handles that pretty simply. You know, you don't know the difference between things on earth and things in heaven. And um, in heaven, these marriages are not the same way they are on earth. Let me put another little digression here. Which is, which is um, some of us who are very happily married kind of are a little bit sad at the idea that marriage ends at death. And Anne Catherine Emmerich, if you are a regular listener, you know I'm a big fan of venerable Anne Catherine Emmerich or blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich now, who is a visionary blessed um, who saw the life of Jesus, including a lot of his teachings, which are not in the Gospels. So it's wonderful to read Anne Catherine Emmerich, just to read the parables of Jesus, maybe, who knows, because it's private revelation, but I take her very seriously, that were left out of the Gospels. And in one of him, them, he does say that um, because that basically marriages can perdure in heaven, there is a type of marriage that um, will result in the couple maintaining their special relationship for all eternity in heaven. It's just not automatic. It just doesn't automatically come with the fact of, of um, going through the sacrament of marriage, or in the case of Judaism, not even the sacrament of marriage, but simply the, um, the legal form of marriage. So basically, what you see here with the story, these, these seven men married this woman because actually it was a, a religious obligation to marry your brother's wife if he hadn't given her any children. So this wasn't exactly the highest form of the union between two souls in marriage. So Jesus, in one of his teachings, in Anne Catherine Emmerich says, no, there is that kind of marriage on earth that, that perdure, perdures to heaven. So anyway... This isn't dogma, you know, but um, this parable does not actually dogmatically state either that all marriages end in heaven. So for those of us who want to hold open that hope rather than that dread, 
we have a ground for holding open that hope. And if it's a dread, then you know from this parable that's not going to be a problem. So anyway, so he handles that first um, question rather easily, uh, the, the question part. But then he doubles down on their not believing in the resurrection. Remember, that wasn't their question. That was just their characteristic that they don't believe in the resurrection. So he just goes at the jugular and he says, look, and by the way, about your rejecting the resurrection, how come God is called every day in your prayer, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Because he's not a God of the dead. He's a God of the living. So they must be living, huh? So anyway, he just gets them back. Uh, anyway, <coughs> excuse me. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. Um, okay. Uh, so then uh, I'll skip a few verses. I'll go to verse 41. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question saying, what do you think of the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David, inspired by the spirit, calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I put thy enemies under thy feet. If David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. Now, this is really important for a number of reasons. One is, of course, that um, Jesus was to call himself the son of God. And so he wanted to make it clear that the Messiah described in the Old Testament was the son of God, not just the son of David. It's very hard to read this verse in English saying, the Lord said to my Lord, da 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 da, -da because it sounds quite kind of convoluted, circular or something. Um, if you look at it in the Psalms, this is another digression, but it's an important thing to know. When you read the Old Testament, usually in most editions, the word Lord will sometimes appear as capital L, lowercase o-r-d, and it will sometimes appear as capital L, capital O, capital R, and capital D. When it appears in all caps, the underlying Hebrew word is not Lord at all. The underlying Hebrew word is the, uh, it's called the Tetragamon. It is the unpronounceable name of God. It is sometimes transliterated as Jehovah. It's sometimes said as Yahweh. Jews are not supposed to say that word. They're not supposed to use the proper name of God. That's his proper name, you know, like my proper name is Roy and somebody's proper name is Mary. And they don't want to use the proper name of God because it's so holy. And because the commandment says, thou shall not use the name of, you shall not use the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And it's impossible to know whether in any situation our use of his proper name is worthy is, is a worthy use of it. So they never they never use the, the name. They never pronounce the name out loud. So when they come across that name in the scriptures, it's essentially Y-H-W-H. -H. You can think of it as that. I'm sure you've seen that. Uh, in Hebrew, it's yud Hey vav Hey. Whenever that is written in the Old Testament, because it's written all over the place in the Old Testament, when they're reading it out loud, uh, and even when they're reading it to themselves, actually, they don't pronounce those words with those vowels. They say instead, Adonai, the Lord, as a circumlocution. As a matter of fact, sometimes nowadays they don't even want to say that because that's too close to being a name of God. So they say Hashem, which means the name, the name that we're not to pronounce. So if you go to, this is all, excuse me, I'm very long-winded. Look at the Psalm in the Old Testament and you'll see that one of those Lords is in all caps and one of them isn't. And that makes it clearer because it's not, you know, the Lord said to my Lord, but it's the proper name of God, um, Yahweh. I'll say Yahweh. Now, just between you and me, it's really interesting to think about that proper name of God, 
the YHWH, is that the most holy trinity, the three persons in one God? Is that the Father God? Or is that Jesus, the Son, who is also God? Anyway, it's it's really fun when you read the Old Testament and you come across that Lord in all caps to mentally substitute either the Father or Jesus or the Most Holy Trinity or whatever and kind of, I don't know. Anyway, it's it's a good thing to do. Anyway, okay, so back to this. The Lord said to my Lord, etc. Clearly, the Psalm is, David in the Psalm is placing the Messiah at a level higher than he, higher than David. So the Messiah can't just be the Messiah because he is the offspring of David, excuse me. And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. Okay. I'm going to continue. I see, I see on the screen that it's already an hour. It's already four o'clock here. So, um, you know, if 40 people send, send comments saying, please hang up, Roy, I'll hang up. But otherwise, I'll just keep going. Um, but anyway, so, and I won't engage the comments, by the way. Um, I'll, I'll let you guys in, engage each other. I do not, uh, let me just say, um, I don't forget that line, but, um, you know, I do not endorse everything that's being said on the comment screen. Um, everyone's welcome. And there's a lot of things that are don't have dogmatic answers to them. And uh, some things do have dogmatic answers. Uh, and and uh, in that case, there may be things on the common screen that are contrary to dogmatic answers. You're absolutely, you know, free. You're absolutely free. It, it's, you know, you're free to do what you want there, but it's not to be interpreted as my endorsement if they're contrary to uh, dogma. Anyway, back to now we've finally got to chapter 23 in the book of Ma Matthew. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to the disciples, to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so practice and observe whatever they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they preach, but they do not practice. They bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by men, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and salutations in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all brethren. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called masters, for you have one master, the Christ. He who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. It's dangerous reading the scriptures, you know, because there isn't, you know, a verse that goes by that I don't want to talk about, but I'm going to let myself talk about this little passage, okay? This whole business of the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, the priests, um, sitting on, uh, you know, practice and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do, for they preach, but they do not practice. They bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with their finger. You know, this the human nature has not changed in 2000 years. Um, I just read something yesterday that took place in Scotland, the Minister of Health in Scotland, who issued the order, not only that the Scots aren't allowed to travel outside of their home unnecessarily, but she specifically said, if you're wealthy and have a second home outside of the city, and you're in the city now, you are forbidden from getting in your car and going to your second home. And a day or two later, she was busted. She was caught by a reporter and photographed going to her country house an hour outside of town. And um, the brouhaha resulted in her having to resign her position as a minister of health because she was perfectly happy to, you know, make these heavy burdens to lay on other people's shoulders 
and be unwilling to even accept that very same burden herself, much less help others with their burden. So anyway, examples of this are not hard to find. Um, then they uh, do all their deeds to be seen by men, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. This refers to the Jewish uh, ritual items, which if I had been planning to do this, I would have brought here so you could see. The phylacteries are those, um, they look like wooden boxes, They're actually hardened leather boxes, uh, black, that the Jews bind to their forehead when they pray with leather straps that they wind in a very particular pattern. The fringes are the tallest, the prayer shawl, which um, ends in, in ritual fringes. They're essentially like sacramentals. And the um, showy Jewish leaders, you know, would make the phylactery big to look holier than anybody else and fringes long to make a big show of their holiness. And they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in synagogues and being called rabbi men and so forth. Now, why am I going into this? I'm going into this actually because he does say call no man father. And I want to talk about what that means and how that doesn't mean that we as Catholics are wrong to call our priests father. So this is going to be a little bit of a lengthy digression. Okay, so um, we see that tendency was the case among the Jewish leaders at the time. I want to suggest that it's part of human nature, and it's the tendency today. In, in, and of course, today is the Catholic Church that's taken place of um, sacramental Judaism, and it's all too prevalent in the Catholic Church. And um, we certainly see it in the... Um, please, I don't want to get in trouble by saying that, there are many wonderful, holy, holy, holy priests, wonderful, holy bishops, wonderful, holy cardinals, and so forth. However, there are also ones who make a show of their holiness, who insist on being addressed um, in formal reverential terms, who insist on everyone else standing back from a doorway, so they're the first who you know, go through the doorway. Um, maybe I can do this. Who insist on always speaking in these extremely grave, deep voices so people know how recollected and holy they are. <laughs> Excuse me for that imitation. And so forth. And um, who place themselves as an intermediary between the people they are to serve and God. And that's really the crime. It's the same crime we talked about earlier in this show. That's what Jesus is talking about when he says, call no man father. He means that whatever their ro sacramental role is, whatever their role is in giving you the sacraments, in giving you spiritual direction, hearing your confessions, uh, um, organizing the church and administering the church, they are not in between you and God. They are not your father in heaven. They are not the patron of your soul. They are not your spouse at the wedding feast of the lamb. They are not to be between you and God. And, and that's what it means, in my opinion, when he says, call no man father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. The master of your soul is the one in heaven. These fathers on earth, whether they be, you know, Father Tom, your parish priest, or your bishop, or the cardinal, or even the vicar of Christ on earth, the pope, um, are not your father in heaven. They're not the master of your soul. They are actually there to be your servants. And the you title, traditional title of the pope, is the servant of the servants, the servant of all. And I'm going to tell a little story here because I, I lead pilgrimages. I've gone on many pilgrimages. So I want to tell two pilgrimage stories, um, which, is, um, which is the following. And I, I may lose, anyway, fine. I may lose viewers. Um, the the it's a very it's a very um okay i'll only tell part of that story because i don't want to be more offensive than i have to 
Um, so I won't be offensive at all. Um, but let me say something actually, because I've been accused of, of judging people because of sounding like I just sounded. Um, I know that Jesus does have the right to judge people, but Jesus wasn't, wasn't judging these people when he said this, when he was saying this. Um, he was not condemning them. He wanted nothing more than their conversion and their salvation. Um, seeing, seeing things as they are, even if what we are seeing in our best judgment does not reflect well on the current behavior of the person or even the current state of their soul is, in my opinion, it is not the, the meaning of judgment which is to be condemned. The meaning of judgment which be, is to be condemned is actually to condemn them, to write them off, to not pray for them to make it to heaven, to not pray for a correction of any faults they may have, uh, whether you're right in thinking you see a fault or not, um, as long as you're praying for their holiness and praying for their sanctification, even if you're wrong in seeing that fault, it doesn't do any harm. It actually is just a source of more prayer, okay? But I'll tell this one story about the pilgrimage, which is I went to Rome on a Catholic pilgrimage. Uh, it, it, of course, it was a sleepless night on the plane. Um, it was a whole day of travel to get on the plane, you know, so basically you've been up for 24 hours. Um, you, you know, you're, you're sticky, you're dirty. You've been on the, you know, on the air travel for 12 hours. First, you had to get to the airport. Maybe that would involve another flight. Um, you get your bags at the airport. This happened to me. This happened to us. Um, we take the train, uh, into Rome from the airport and, uh, take another train, I think, or a bus or a walk. I don't remember to where we're staying. And one of the women on the pilgrimage, okay, so now all I want to do is take a shower, have something to eat and go to bed. One of the women on the pilgrimage finds she has the wrong suitcase. She grabs somebody else's suitcase from the carousel. And somebody has to go back to the airport with this suitcase by public transportation, you know, give it back to the luggage desk there and get the missing suitcase and bring it home. And who is it? Who's the first one with his hand up and says, I'll go. It was actually the chaplain of the trip was our, was, was the priest who was invited along on the trip. And not only did he say it, but all of us selfish fallen people <laughs> were happy that he said it and let him do it. Anyway, very, very, very beautiful example of how one can take one's position of authority and one's role as father and see it as being the servant of all, which is exactly what Jesus said here when he says, he who is the greatest among you shall be your servant. And this wonderful priest who uh, I'm still friends with and is a really, really wonderful priest, clearly humbled himself and kind of washed the feet of the pilgrims by being the one who schlepped back to the airport to get the bag. So anyway, okay, so back to uh, Matthew 23. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut the kingdom of heaven against men, and you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you cross sea and land to make a single convert, and when he becomes a convert, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Uh, little confession here. It says here, hip, it says proselyte, not convert. But that gets into an issue that I'll explain since this is all about the Jewish connection, which is a, 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 a formal conversion to Judaism requires circumcision if you're a male. And so most adult males who converted to Judaism would not undergo circumcision. So they wouldn't be full Jews, 100% Jews, Jewish converts. They would be what's called proselyte, which is somebody who worshiped as a Jew, 
who uh, believed in Judaism, who worshipped the God of Judaism, who followed the laws of Judaism, but who had not undergone ritual circumcision. So basically, if I said proselyte, you wouldn't know what that meant. But if I said convert, you'd actually have the right idea. So that's why I said convert. Um, and then he goes on and on and on and on, condemning them. Woe to you, blind guides. Uh, woe to you, blind fools. Um, you blind men, for which is great. Well, uh, uh, anyway. The, uh, anyway, I, I, I don't want to go through all of them in the interest of time. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe, mint, and dill, and common, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, and mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat, and swallowing a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and of the plate, but inside... They are full of extortion and rapacity. You blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and of the plate, that the outside may also be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of innocent Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Barachiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly, I say to you, all this will come upon this generation. Now, it's kind of severe. I don't want to add too much because I'll be condemned for sounding harsh. But of course, look at what Jesus was about to do. He was about to be crucified. He was about to suffer worse than anyone ever suffered, to give his life, his his blood, to enable men to be redeemed, including the men that he was describing here. He earned the right, let me say, to be harsh with them. He was giving them a last call to repentance. And um, he was also correctly prophesying because when he said, truly, all this will come upon this generation, it's true. Within 40 years, um, all of that persecution came and that horrible chastisement on Jerusalem when the streets ran with blood and where mothers actually ate their infant children out of the starvation and so forth. And the slaughter was unbelievable. And it finally ended up with Jerusalem being burned to the ground. It all was fulfilled. So not only was it a call to repentance, but it was also correct prophecy. And now he immediately turns in to an expression of his heartbreak over the failure of the Jewish world at the time to accept him, especially the Jewish leadership. So lest one think he's being unsympathetic, the very next words are the following. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who are sent to you. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you would not. Behold, your house is forsaken and desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So here is this heart-rending. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you would not, and so forth. Um, a mother's love for her children, right? The mother hen who, who wants to spread her wings over her chicks to protect them, but those chicks refuse, refuse to gather at you know, the breast of the mother. 
um, how often would I have gathered your children together, but you would not have me. He's weeping. He's literally weeping. In fact, the spot where he said this is about halfway up the Mount of Olives. Um, he says this leaving Jerusalem after having given this very harsh teaching, right, on the, at the temple itself to the Jewish leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees and so forth, and his disciples. He's walking back to Bethany for the evening. He stops halfway up the Mount of Olives. That place is a shrine. It's a shrine that I wouldn't dream of omitting from one of the pilgrimages I lead to the Holy Land. By the way, a little advertisement. Send me an email at haveroytalk at gmail.com if you're interested on my pilgrimages to the Holy Land. Uh, I have space on the one in November, but I may even have space on the one this May if it's able to go because of the cancellations because of this pandemic. So you never know. Uh, let me know and I'll put you on a list to be informed about future pilgrimages. We always go to the spot. It's called to this day Dominus Flavit, which is simply Latin for the Lord wept because he was weeping over Jerusalem. And this is when he was doing that. In other words, he had, he had, I don't want to say cursed, but he had given this extremely stern teaching, telling the Jewish leaders what was awaiting them, bemoaning their rejection of him. He's walking back for the evening to be spent at the house of Martha and Mary, his friends, his closest disciples and his apostles to regain his forces for the rest of Holy Week. Halfway up the Mount of Olives, Bethany is at the top of the Mount of Olives. He stops. He's looking out over Jerusalem. From this spot, you look down over the Temple Mount and you see, you can see the temple. You can see the platform of the Temple Mount and the Jews gathered there. You can see the Golden Gate through which he had processed uh, the day before, a day or two before on Palm Sunday. Because by the, now we don't know whether this is Monday or Tuesday that he's that this is taking place. And he is weeping literally over Jerusalem, overlooking Jerusalem, looking at Jerusalem, looking at the very platform, the sidewalk in front of the temple where the plaza, I should say, in front of the temple, where he had been giving his teaching, you know, a half an hour earlier. And he's weeping, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood, gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not have me. Behold, your house is forsaken and desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Baruch haba b'shem Yahweh. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. That verse is the basis of the church teaching. It's in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 674, that for the second coming to happen, there has to be a widespread, <coughs> excuse me, conversion of the Jews. Um, uh, paragraph 674 says, quote, the glorious Messiah's coming is suspended at every moment of history until his recognition by all Israel. And it cites this verse. That's his recognition by all Israel is when they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When they say, blessed is he who comes with reference to Jesus, the Messiah, that is when he will come again. That is when they will see him again. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Paragraph 674, the glorious Messiah's coming is suspended at every moment of history until their recognition of all Israel. That's what this ministry is about. It's about, um, on the one hand, understanding the Jewish roots of the Catholic Church, even of the sacraments, um, uh, at least the Jewish prefigurements of the Catholic Church and the, Catholic, the sacraments. But it's also about praying for the conversion of the Jews so that the second coming can happen. I am going to close the show at this point because it will have been an hour and a half long, which is straining anybody's patience. I will pick up here tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow I should be able to do it live at the same time. I will pick up here in the scriptures but also pick up here in the theme of the show. 
I'll talk a little bit about Spy Wednesday and uh, Judas's betrayal, of course, but I will also talk about, um, see, what's interesting here is I was reading from Matthew 23 and Matthew 24, immediately, Jesus is talking about the second coming, how you'll be able to tell when is the time of the second coming, what will precede the second coming, a timeline for the second coming. And so uh, tomorrow, since I'm ending this show on talking about the conversion of the Jews that has to precede the second coming, uh, and I'm also ending the show at the end of Matthew 23, uh, is a perfect opportunity tomorrow to pick up where I left off, both with Matthew 24 and therefore with the second coming and what we know about the second coming. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, there'll be things that tie that together with what we're seeing now. Okay, well, here I am live, and um, I am going to disappear. Excuse me. <coughs> and um, I'm going to turn, I'm going to start up the beautiful Harbour Day music here. Let me start that up first. Gloria laus et honor tibisit, Rex Christe Redemptor, cui pueri ledecus, promsito sana Israel is to Rex, David is a tinkita prolis, nomine qui in domini, Rex benedicte venis, se tu sine. Celsius, te laudat celicus omnis, et mortal et cum ta creata simul. Gloria laus et honor Rex Christe Redemptor, cui pueri ledecus, promsito sana piu, plebs ebrea. See you. 
bibisit, Rex Christi Redemptor, coi puerile de cus, promsito sana
sit, Rex Christi Redemptor, cui puerile decus, promsito sana, peace.